It's Jonathan Gerber here with the Jerusalem Portfolio, and thanks for joining me today while we call Jonathan Medved in Jerusalem, and then patch in his colleague, Morris Lester of Migvax. We're going to be talking to Jonathan Medved about what's going on in Jerusalem right now, and then to bring on Morris Lester to understand how Migvax is helping the world by advancing the development of a corona vaccine. Thank you. I do want to point out that Mivas is not a publicly traded company and therefore not part of our portfolio or strategy, but it's still a great illustration of Israeli innovation, ideas, and design. How are you, Jonathan? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? Jonathan, how is life in Jerusalem right now? Is, are you kidding? Israel is paradise. I mean, you know, they're expecting now in the next 18 months 200,000 new Olim and Israelis coming home. Because you have to be a nut to live in exile now. I mean, it's really, it makes no sense. You know, when you look at 2,000 Jews died in, in France so far, 250 have died here. Our population yeah. is 10x theirs. So that's 100 times more likely to die. In Britain, 400 Jews died. Our population is, you know, 30 times, 40 times that. And it's just it's, it's it's no longer it's no longer that it's smarter to be here economically, but it's a matter of life and death. It's craziness. We're back to work. Beaches are open. Everybody's back to school by the end of this week, from kindergarten to twelve. It's it's really a different reality. Our That's number really of amazing. New, it is it is extraordinary right now. Before we bring Morris Laster on from the Migvax team. Where are they in their development? They're in ma they're in mammals now, okay, and they will be in humans within the next ninety days, probably sooner. And and w so when that and testing and trials and when does that become available to you and I? Well, it, it, it's probably once they start the human test, it'll be six to nine months before it's available. And the, the big issue here is that. Given the unique nature of the vaccine, the safety is is very much obvious, so you probably can skip that stage. It's an oral vaccine, and it's a wow. vaccine that already exists and was given to chickens. John, what's the story here? How did this all come to be? The, the story here is it's almost too good to be true. I mean, it's like Jewish chicken soup will save the world, right? You know, like penicillin was Jewish, you know, ch ch chicken soup is Jewish penicillin. You know, so yeah. these guys were four years ago. Um, it's a research institute up in the Galil called Migal, and they were told to go make a vaccine for uh, chicken flu, for avian flu, which was devastating the chicken coops in the country. And they started researching it, found that it's a coronavirus that uh, was affecting the chickens. They developed the vaccine, took them four years to do it and to test it. It works like a champ. It just completely wipes out the damn thing. And they were getting ready to start market it when all of a sudden COVID broke and they looked at the data that was emerging on the structure of the virus and they said, wait a minute, this looks just like our virus. And it turns out it's like a really close cousin. And they spent another two and a half, three months since the news broke redesigning the vaccine from chickens to humans for this, from that, the, the specific kind of coronavirus that affected the chickens to deal with this one. But because they have a platform virus that Morris can explain what, you know, why it's similar, um, so they got that done, and now they're testing this in mice and, and you know, other rodents, and then they're going to be testing it in humans shortly. What makes it, the, um, turns out the virus is oral, Okay, so it doesn't mm -hmm. require a shot. It doesn't include live or dead virus, okay, so that it can be used with a severely immune, immunocompromised, and that's one of the big problems with a lot of the wow. uh, vaccine approaches is that they use, you know, uh, very, very small amounts of either live or dead virus. This uses none of the above. This is um, working on three levels of immunity, mucosal immunity, so it handles the mucous membranes in the nose. It's working on cell immunity and systemic immunity. And it's a platform, so it's really good for mutations. 
So it's got a bunch of inherent advantages. And all I can tell you is I was on a call with a professor, full professor at MIT last week, who knew the institute, knew their work, and he was freaking out when he heard this because he's familiar with what's going on Moderna and uh, Pfizer and whatnot and thought that this was so light years away Thanks, Morris. from what hi Morris okay M Dr. Morris Laster who heads our medical investment team meet my good friend Jonathan Gerber and his team from the Jerusalem portfolio uh, Morris tell us why this is the vaccine to back okay so MIGVAX basically started out in Miguel. Miguel is a, a multidisciplinary research institute up in the north in Miguel. And about four years ago, the Israeli government um, re realized that there was a need for a new coronavirus vaccine for chickens because the commercially available one wasn't doing a good job. And so the scientists set out to basically develop a new oral vaccine for chickens that they can just put in the, in the chicken feed, like kind of spray it in there. Uh, and what they developed was an orally available uh, vaccine that utilizes a protein from the E. coli bacteria that basically uh, gets uh, sucked up by the cells of the mucosa of the oral pharynx and the gut um, and then enables uh, vaccination. Now, they used two, three different antigens in the chicken virus, and they did a challenge study. So they basically challenged, after vaccination, they challenged the chickens with IBV and showed that they were able to eliminate viral shedding uh, much, much better than the uh, commercial vaccine, which basically barely touched it. And they were able to significantly reduce viral titers, uh, which would you expect from a vaccine? Um, and all those results came out right on the eve of the pandemic, the current pandemic. And they realized when they looked at the antigen sequences of the S and the Ns of the antigens they're looking at, they're very, very similar to the COVID-19 sequences. And they basically um, started on a development plan to develop it for COVID-19, and that's where we're at. Now, the reason this is attractive is because basically it's an oral route. So most of the other vaccines, so you, you know, the classical vaccine is either you take a virus, you kill it, you give it. Uh, that has the, um, the risk of promoting what's called enhancement. So very often when a patient re- Resees the virus in a way from a dead vaccine, it can cause an even worse reaction from the immune reaction of the vaccine itself and the reinfection. The beauty behind what this vaccine does, because of the way it enters the body through the mucosal membranes, it generates an immune response that is blood based called IgG, secretory based, which is called IgA, it's present in the oropharynx where basically the virus would potentially meet the patient. So basically it's getting hit right before it really gets in and gets a chance to even infect. And even if it does infect the person, uh, the, the vaccine that's been generating the chickens generates what's called cell-mediated immunity and is able to kill the uh, cells that are infected. So basically it stimulates three parts of the immune system. Other vaccines aren't, uh, don't, are not anticipated to do so. Um, and it's also expected to have less toxicity, and it's orally available. So in case, for example, you don't need a nurse to administer, you don't need someone to give a shot, uh, you give, you know, a schluck like you do with the oral polio vaccine, a couple of drops, and you're done. What about wow. mutations? Wow. I'm sorry? What about mutations in the platform nature? Oh, so for right now, basically, the mutations haven't touched the sequences that we've been looking at. Um, but it's very simple to change the antigens like it is with the flu. So the important part here really is the carrier. It's called the LTD carrier that allows the antigens to present to the body in a certain way. If there are any mutations that are found, you can easily switch out the antigen, put it on the carrier, and, and get off to the races. The flu. This type of technology, or is this completely unique to your lab? No, no, people have used LTD in, in veterinary uses. There's a, a vaccine that's in clinical trials for cholera uh, toxin that's using LTB, uh, but what's unique about this group is basically their uh, bioinformatic approach to looking at which, which sequences are important on the antigen and the fusion to the LTB and the generation of this particular route of vaccine. Uh, we just had uh, conversations in the past week, actually today uh, with the Paul Ehrlich Institute of the EU and last week with the NIH, uh, basically both of them were intrigued and were attracted by the oral approach. 
So to, are we starting this week with mammals? Are we in mice this week? Hopefully in the next week or so. Humans start this summer. What's your thoughts on the need for multiple vaccines as opposed to one winner take all in this approach? Well, I mean, you know, as, as in the presentation, the uh, CEO of GSK said it best, we're going to need more than one vaccine. No one's going to be able to make billions of doses in the speed with which it's going to be necessary. And we don't even know which one's going to win, and which one's going to work. We don't know how many are going to work. Um, but no one's going to be able to generate the amount of vaccine you need in the time you need it. So, and people will be looking out for their own regions, right? So if Moderna comes through first, it's going to take care of America and then worry about the rest of the world afterwards. If the team at Oxford wins, it's going to take care of Great Britain first and then worry about the rest of the world afterwards. There are whole regions of the world that are being left out. Um, they're going to need you, you know that, that uh, what, you know the most unbelievable story is that we've been contacted now <laughs> at our crowd by several countries' embassies who are saying, "Would you like investment if we can get on some kind of priority list for the vaccine?" Wow, it's not it's not funny, but it's it's this is the reality uh, that we're dealing with now. I mean, you need to generate billions of doses. I mean, it's insane the amount that, you know, the biggest manuf the biggest issue beyond efficacy is going to be manufacturing, and, and it's a huge issue. And, by the way, it's another advantage of this system because we're we're making them in fermenters, and, and they may even be where they may not. Basically, the bacteria make the vaccine. So you stick a bunch of bacteria in, you put in some sugar, a little bit of heat. Two weeks later, you have a bunch of doses. And the more the more fermenters you use, the more vaccine you can get. It's a, ours is a very a, a much. Some of these vaccines are going to be really hard to manufacture. Ours should not be. The way you're describing the production and the and the uh, and, and the, or the administration doesn't sound like a traditional vaccine. Is it still technically referred to as a vaccine? Sure, because it does the uh, what the vaccine does is stimulate the immune system against a specific antigen, so you don't get the disease, and that's what it does. There are if you look if you look at this stuff that's coming out of the WHO. And these uh, lists that there seem to be about seven or eight generic approaches. There are so many different ways to do this. Uh, you know, I think we fall into the subunit approach. How would you describe this subunit vaccine? Well, right, it's a subunit. Basically, look, for example, so if I go through the various kinds of vaccines, you have what's called live attenuated, which is live but weakened. No one in their right mind, in my opinion, would give a live attenuated coronavirus to anybody. Okay, then you have a killed vaccine, which is what the Chinese are working on. Um, you have what's called the mRNA approach, which basically uh, Moderna and CureVac are using, and many others are using, where, you, where you're basically in do, you're, you're taking a piece of genetic material, you're injecting it into the muscle. The muscle is then creating what, what would be called the subunit or the spike antigen of the coronavirus. And then basically because that protein is foreign to humans, the, the body generates an immune response to it. So that is the Moderna approach, and that's the approach of a lot of them. Other so you're basically are, teaching, teaching, of, teaching the body to attack generically the spike. Right. Or you could just make the spike and add an adjuvant or something that stimulates the immune system and inject that combination to people. But that's more expensive than having the person make the protein by himself with genetic material, which is cheaper. Okay, you can then have an adenovirus with genetic material. So you inject the person with a virus that then gets the genetic material into the cells to make the spike antigen again. So there are different approaches to getting this done. Uh, you can give just a spike antigen. So those would be considered subunit approaches. And we're a form of subunit approach, so we're just doing it orally. We're using the spike antigen and what's called the nucleocapsid antigen, which stimulates cell mediated immunity. So that gives us a tripartite hit, where most people are just going after the spike. Where are you on the race towards finding a vaccine as compared to some of your competition around the world? So we're behind. I mean, we're behind some, we're ahead of others. Uh, the fact that, you know, we have this uh, coronavirus challenge puts us a little bit ahead of most people. But we're still behind people who are obviously in the clinic. Uh, but again, the race is not, you know, I think what's going to end up happening is that um, and this seems to be coming out, there's going to be people need a vaccine. If you can show immunogenicity and you can show that your vaccine does not stimulate an enhancement effect, 
they're probably going to let you go. But again, there's going to be more than one winner, and the timelines are not that far behind. I mean, we're going to start a phase one, two study in the summer and hopefully finish by the, uh, by the early 2021. It's not that far behind. And how quickly could you modify the drug for uh, mutations as they evolve? So it's a simple, you know, bioinformatic uh, exercise. You change the genetic code in the E. coli and we'll pump out the new one. But you have to prove the system first. And we're going to have to prove that we can get an antibodies, neutralizing antibodies to uh, to the current virus before dealing with the mutations. If the mutation yeah, in other happens, words, we... Yeah. You, you've got to get this, the basic platform to work. I do have one more question for you, Morris. What is it unique to the Israeli culture and psyche that allowed your team to innovate this way? You know what? I think that there was a, there was a pressure. Uh, you know, the, the Israeli government was pressured in the fact that they realized that there was a problem with their chickens and the viruses. And then they realized that the approach can be translated. You know, they said, hey, we're working on this already. It's like the same thing. When we look at MERS, we look at SARS, we look at this, the areas that we're looking at and we looked at in the chicken are pretty much homologous. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a 180 degree pivot. It was kind of like a five degree pivot. Morris, this means that this, this, this approach has utility beyond this particular yeah. COVID-19 virus as well. Sure. If it works, it can work for influenza, it can work for others too. Phenomenal. Thank you for your time, Morris. Thanks, Morris. Thank you. Nice to meet Thank you. you. Thank you very much for listening to that great conversation with Jonathan Medved and Morris Laster. To invest in Israel, visit thejerusalemportfolio.com where you could easily open your own brokerage account or make a gift to a loved one. The assets remain here in the United States, custodied here, and managed by U.S.-based investment advisors. Give us a call at 855-5-ISRAEL or visit us online at www.thejerusalemportfolio.com. Thanks very much. Thank you.